Hello everyone. In this unit, we turn our attention to the implementation of eFlows. Over the past few months, we've learned about the biophysical and social sciences underpinning eFlows, a range of methods for assessing eFlow requirements, and the importance of engaging stakeholders in the assessment process. Now, with recommendations in hand, we want to consider the instruments and mechanisms commonly utilized to implement eFlows in water resource management, ideally as part of integrated water resource management. We'll begin by considering the implementation of eFlows for dams, which requires that we first learn something about the dams themselves, including their numbers, types, and purposes, as well as the available instruments to influence their operation and delivery of eFlows. In Unit 1, we learned about the extent of river fragmentation and flow regulation caused by about 6,400 current large dams and 3,400 planned large dams worldwide. You saw this figure in Unit 1. It presents the effects of these dams on river connectivity and flow over the past century and into the foreseeable future. The potential impact on connectivity comes from the barrier effect of dams, which blocks migrations of river organisms, but also disrupts fluxes of sediment, nutrients, particulate organic matter, and other drifting biological substances like seeds and eggs. While solutions to this fragmentation of rivers require actions well beyond the implementation of eFlows, in this lecture we'll consider implementation actions that address both. The potential impact of dams on river flow is represented by a river regulation index calculated as a weighted and then basin averaged value of the proportion of a river's annual flow volume that can be withheld by a reservoir or a cluster of reservoirs in the basin. See the 2015 paper by Lerner and others for details. This factor is strongly influenced by the volume of reservoirs behind dams. In extreme cases, like Lakes Mead and Powell on the Colorado River, reservoirs can store about two years of inflow. In this figure, the impact is considered severe if the storage in the basin is 60% or more of the annual flow. Notice that earlier I referred to the potential impact on connectivity and potential impact on flows, because the nature and degree of the impact depends on the siting, design, and operation of the dams. But we've also learned that all dams are not alike. The International Commission on Large Dams maintains a database of more than 58,000 dams that are 15 meters or more in height and impound more than 3 million cubic meters of water. For those with data about the purpose of the dam, approximately half are for single purposes, although these purposes vary as shown on the figure and in its legend. A smaller proportion of dams with known uses are multi-purpose, but the numbers are still substantial. We must also not forget that there are millions of smaller dams around the world. Irrigation is the most common purpose of single-purpose large dams, followed by hydropower, water supply, and flood control. Irrigation is also the most common purpose in multi-purpose dams, more closely followed by flood control, water supply, and then hydropower. Large numbers of dams for irrigation and hydropower are single-purpose, while more flood control and water supply dams are multi-purpose. These relationships between individual uses and the tendency to favor single or multi-purpose dams is relevant to eFlow's implementation because each use corresponds to a different water use sector with its own legal frameworks and magnitude and timing of water needs. Looking at dam types, most are earth dams followed by equal proportions of rock fill and gravity dams. Far fewer dams are buttress or arch types, but some of these are major dams exerting large impacts on the rivers they impound. As mentioned in slide two, the potential impact of any dam on downstream flow regimes depends on the volume of storage behind it versus flow in the river. Dams creating reservoirs with significant storage are called storage dams. Storing a large volume of water relative to the river inflow provides the water manager with the ability to dictate the downstream flow regime based on the dam's purpose. Flood flows can be captured and stored for later use, during dry seasons or even between years. 
Storage dams that have not taken eFlows into consideration in their design or operation will likely require the greatest amount of reoperation and even retrofitting to be able to provide eFlows. Dams impounding uh, a small volume of water relative to river flow are called run of river dams. They're common both for the generation of base flow hydropower and for diverting river waters into irrigation canals. Single purpose run of river dams for hydropower are generally designed to divert about 100 to 150 percent of the average river flow through the turbines. Because the dams are not generally very tall, Diverted waters are normally transferred by tunnel or canal some kilometers downstream to maximize the head difference and associated hydropower potential. This creates dewatered reaches between the dam and the point after the turbine where the flow is returned to the river. Below this point, impact of the flow regime will be minor, unless the diversion has crossed a basin boundary and discharged into a different river. If run-of-river dams divert water for irrigation or other consumptive water supply purposes, downstream flows may still be severely impacted, especially during lower flows when the diversion potential of the dam may exceed the river's flow. I'd like to briefly mention levees as another form of impactful infrastructure affecting flow regimes and connectivity in river corridors. Levees and dikes are embankments running the longitudinal length of rivers and generally intended to protect, protect adjacent lands, former floodplains, from flooding. This photo is from here in the Netherlands, where rivers are highly engineered. Levees prevent rising water levels from spilling into floodplain areas and thus direct them downstream at unnatural levels. They also isolate river organisms from critical floodplain habitats. Moving levees and dikes back from rivers to allow for more flooding and flooded habitats is a restoration measure being applied here in the Netherlands and in other parts of Europe and the world. This photo is of the Isel River, where a new two-kilometer dike was built 300 meters further from the river. Another means of achieving more room for the river is to remove levees and allow flooding on farmlands. In this mechanism, Farmers are compensated for lost crops through easement arrangements. The measures restore lateral connectivity, open up new floodplain habitats, and more naturally attenuate flood waves. Turning our attention back to dams, we've seen that dams come in many types and are operated for single or multiple purposes. It's also important to recognize that dams are highly valued elements in larger water management systems linked to public health and safety, food supply, energy generation, economic markets, and increasingly environmental management. So changes to dam and reservoir operation will impact the balance of dam services provided to these sectors and will likely require wider adjustments in the sectors. This is a photo of Hume Dam on the River uh, Murray in Australia. Construction of the dam began in 1919. It's 51 meters tall and is a mix of a concrete gravity dam with four earth embankments. You'll note from the Google Earth image that the dam produces a large storage reservoir holding over 3 million gigaliters and having a surface area of over 200 square kilometers. With a reservoir of this size, Hume Dam is able to strongly influence the flow regime of the Murray River and choices about how much water to release and when determine the downstream flow regime. Hume Dam and Lake are used for flood mitigation, hydropower, irrigation, water supply, and most recently, environmental conservation. As a result of the purchase of environmental water that you've learned about in this course, a significant amount of the water in Hume Lake is for the environment. Consequently, the operating rules for the dam were modified in February 2017 to formally incorporate environmental water releases. I've placed a description of these rule changes in the additional reading material for this unit. A very different situation is that of Sukur Barrage on the Indus River. The barrage is a run of river structure built in 1932 to divert water to a roughly 10,000 kilometer network of canals irrigating more than 30,000 square kilometers of agricultural fields. It consists of a stone and iron retaining wall containing 66 outfall gates, 
each 18 meters wide that can be opened and closed to regulate flows. During low flows, the barrage may divert a majority of the river's flow, while during floods, uh, the gates are open to route water and floodwaters and sediments downstream as quickly as possible. Destructive flooding is a recurring problem along the Indus, and flood defenses consist mainly of dikes to protect areas from flooding and barrages that can be opened fully to route the flood wave downstream. The barrage is currently being rehabilitated with funding from the World Bank, and e-flows are being taken into consideration. This is to assist in the protection and recovery of populations of the Indus River Dolphin, which have been declining in numbers and have even disappeared from sections of the river between barrages. Morello's Dam is another diversion structure, but special in that it's the final dam on the Colorado River. It lies on the border of the USA and Mexico and is operated by Mexican authorities to divert the last drops of the Colorado River to agricultural fields in the Colorado River Delta. In most years, the river does not reach the sea, and there are no eFlows requirements applied to the dam operation. But in 2014, Mexico and the USA agreed to an experimental release of 130 million cubic meters of water to restore flow to the last 100 kilometers of the river and to study the effects. This will become the basis for future releases to help restore the Colorado River Delta. Water for the Pulse was released from Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam and flowed more than 500 kilometers to Morelos Dam. You'll find a video and National Geographic article in the additional materials for this unit if you'd like to learn more. In these few cases, we've seen examples of different mechanisms for modifying the operation of existing dams, even those constructed nearly a century ago, to implement eFlows. Hume Dam operations were modified as part of the implementation of the Murray-Darling Plan. Sukur Barrage operations are being modified as part of a major rehabilitation program financed by the World Bank. And Morello's Dam operation was modified, even if briefly, thanks to an agreement by Mexico and the USA. The implementation of eFlows for dams is dependent upon mechanisms and opportunities such as these. These represent management decision points where change is possible. Given that most dams, and certainly large dams, are subject to regulation by some government authority, the most common and recurring management decision points are associated with dam licensing. Licenses must be acquired at the time of dam construction, and in most countries they must be renewed every 20 to 50 years. Major rehabilitation works may also provide opportunities for change, as we saw with Sukur Barrage. Decision points such as these often require the submission of an environmental and social impact assessment, demonstrating that the licensed applicant has thoroughly considered these issues and has built in mitigation measures as part of their proposed rehabilitation and continued operation. You'll learn much more about ESIAs in the lecture of Angelis during this unit, so let me just say something about licensing and also the potential influence of multilateral development banks and, increasingly, private sector alliances. I'll use an example of relicensing for hydropower. In the USA, all hydropower dams are regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, even though more than 80% of hydropower dams are not owned or operated by the government. The relicensing process takes five to 10 years and recurs every 30 years. Relicensing has a strong emphasis on environmental and social concerns and includes a public process in which stakeholders may request that detailed studies be conducted to evaluate the impact of the relic relicensing on soils, water quality, fish and wildlife, cultural, recreation, aesthetics, land use, and tribal resources. With respect to eFlows, FERC requires that studies employ methods that are generally accepted in the scientific community, and the in-stream flow incremental method you learned about in Unit 10 is mentioned explicitly. Similar licensing and relicensing processes exist in many countries around the world where significant amounts of hydropower are already installed. Although relicensing occurs only infrequently, it's a serious process. All hydropower dam operators ultimately must pass through. 
so it's a crucial decision point in which eFlows can be embedded in DAM operation rules. Over the past 50 years, the multilateral development banks have played a large role in guiding and financing development in many countries, especially those destined for more dam building in coming years. Each bank has put in place safeguards to minimize negative social and environmental impacts of projects they support. They also provide guidance documents for applicants to assist them in meeting bank safeguard standards, and most banks now offer guidance related to eFlows. These three guidance documents are in your additional reading for this unit. EFLOW recommendations will generally be included among the mitigation measures in environmental and social impact assessments. Today, the prominence and influence of the development banks is becoming less as larger sums of private sector capital are invested in developing parts of the world. Many of these new privately financed projects will be subject only to the national policies and regulations in the countries where they're built. Environmental standards will thus vary greatly from country to country, and in many cases they will be less stringent than those of the banks or more developed countries. As a way of self-regulating, many new initiatives have been launched to put in place voluntary standards and protocols that private sector companies agree to follow in their projects. A prominent example of this is the Hydropower Sustainability Assessment Protocol, which was developed by the International Hydropower Association in cooperation with a diverse stakeholder forum. The HSAP devotes attention to more than 20 sustainability topics encompassing social, environmental, economic, and technical components of dams and reservoirs during four stages of development. The stages considered, from early stage to operation, are indicated in the top right of the slide. The individual topics are listed from P1 to P23. Note that P23 is downstream flow regimes. Dams are scored for each topic on a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 indicating that there are significant gaps relative to basic good practice, 3 indicating basic good practice, and 5 indicating proven best practice. The spider graph shown to the right illustrates the score of each topic on a single graph. Note in this case that the topic of downstream flow regime, P23, is scored as proven best practice. The scoring takes into consideration 1. Whether a field-based eFlows assessment was conducted and eFlows recommended to achieve different environmental, social, and economic objectives. two whether management processes are in place to deliver the downstream flow regime, monitor that objectives are being achieved, and anticipate and respond to emerging risks and opportunities, and three, whether stakeholders have been properly engaged and have an ongoing ability to raise issues about downstream flow regimes and get feedback. Full conformance and compliance with proven best practice is expected if dams are to maintain their high score. The Hydropower Sustainability Assessment Protocol was published in 2010 and generally well received by the major companies in the hydropower sector, but uptake and implementation of the protocol in projects around the world has been slow, so it remains to be seen whether industry-led initiatives like this will be successful in raising the level of eFlows implementation on the ground. Take-home messages for this first lecture about implementation of eFlows for dams. We learned that dams may be operated for single or multiple purposes, most commonly for irrigation, hydropower, water supply, flood control, navigation, recreation, and environmental conservation. A critical distinction for eFlows implementation is whether dams impound large storage reservoirs or operate in a run-of-river mode. Storage dams have greater potential to alter all components of a river's flow regime, including the elimination of flood peaks. Run-of-river projects for hydropower have smaller effects on flow regimes downstream of return flows, but run-of-river diversions for irrigation or other consumptive uses can severely impact mid to lower flow levels. The most important management decision points for incorporating e-flows into the operation of dams is at the time of original licensing or relicensing. These opportunities don't come often, but nearly all dams are subject to them. 
financiers like the multilateral development banks also facilitate the implementation of eFlows in their loan approval processes, but their influence is diminishing. The private sector has taken some positive steps to jointly commit to implementation of at least good practice and preferably best practice in eFlows implementation, but it's yet to be seen whether these initiatives will succeed. That's the end of this lecture. Thank you very much.